Top Med Talk. Right, hi, it's Monty Mython here, Editor-in-Chief of Top Med Talk, coming to you with another of our COVID-19 from the front line. So I'm at my house in London, in England, uh, doing a bit of distancing, going to go into the hospital tomorrow, see how things are going on. I've just caught up with Professor Mike Grocott from Southampton, who's a regular on Top Med Talk, who's just come off a major shift in Southampton at the hospital there. Mike, how's it been? We're good. We're a little bit behind London from what I can gauge from all the social media chat and WhatsApp, but we've got now, three now, you positive... You say behind London, Mike, you mean in numbers of cases, not in mental acuity? Or... Yeah, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we've been planning for a while. <laughs> but I think in terms of the breaking wave of COVID, the uptick on that epidemiological curve that we keep seeing, I think we are probably a few days maybe a week if we're lucky behind what I can mm. see happening in London and what we've seen happening in other countries, Italy in particular. Well, I think we're all blessed in a way that we've had all this opportunity to prepare and all the, the learning that we've got from China, South Korea, you know, Hong Kong, Italy in particular from the European perspective. So I get the sense there's, there's a sort of, in many places, an eerie calmness at the moment but in other places, some of our local hospitals near here where I am in Ealing have been overwhelmed. We very much feel the calm before the storm and we are using that, working very hard to make sure we're prepared. And I think you kind of think you've got most things done. And so I think that the doctors are largely ready and we've got a rollout plan. I think one of the things we realised probably a little bit later is that we've been less good at communicating with our nursing and other non-medical colleagues and particularly maybe some of the theatre staff who will be essential in as we spread out beyond intensive care into other clinical spaces theatres in particular and they're probably not getting briefed quite as well as we are and i'm not sure their professional communication is as effective as us so i think think there's quite a big job of medical leadership within hospitals to make sure that all our colleagues understand not just our medical colleagues yeah very very important stuff now what have you done about the recently retired mike or people who've been deployed in other spaces because i as you know we celebrated what i thought was (laughs) my last day on call on intensive care after 35 years or whatever it is but uh, i'm back on the roaster and i'll be back in again soon which you know very important that we all do our bit but that's only a a few weeks ago and i've just read all the guidelines and there's nothing clever in there and it doesn't look as though it's very complicated intensive care so i'm feeling confident about my abilities to do the right thing it's the same old game in principle so we in common with some other places so we've actually had a couple of our doctors step off the rotor because we're concerned about the clinical risk for obviously for reasons I won't go into the detail of Mm. and I know that other centers have looked at putting an age bar around 55 maybe a little bit older saying actually the the risk to the individual practitioner is too high and they should be deployed on non-frontline activities although given the rate of the virus as I understand it out in the community that may be just as dangerous as dealing with the patients but we have been uh, we've tried to release those that might be at risk from clinical duties certainly on the intensive care. Over 55 wow I mean that for our intensive care unit you know our my colleagues <laughs> I do. it's going to leave a lot of rotor gaps I think we this is going to go out on the podcast a lot of people are going to hear that but uh, well, so how... we didn't do the age thing in Southampton yeah. but we have we have certainly released uh, one colleague it depends on what you call the front line as well, because, I mean, the, uh, from the point of view of doing ward rounds once everything is under control in full PPE, I, I don't see any major risks in that compared to a regular day at the office. It, this may sound very, for those people listening who don't do intensive care, this may sound as though I'm not taking this seriously, but we're, we're very commonly and regularly exposed to very serious risks. So protecting ourselves and protecting our patients is every day at the office. From the point of view of the front line being evaluation of yet determined whether they do or don't have and airway management in the frenzy and intubation, etc., that sounds absolutely sensible to me because there are plenty of strong young people who can offer to do that. Yeah, and I mean, I think if you take the PPE seriously and the donning and doffing, uh, it, it should be very safe. But we do have to be really, really methodical about doing that, I think. Now, I'm going to come back to the donning and doffing in a moment. Now, we've all, I'd say, thankfully, been grounded, which uh, is, again, it's really really rather pleasant for those of us to do a little bit more travelling, uh, allegedly in the name of spreading the a- academic uh, mission and learning from others. 
Uh, we were uh, relatively recently, before all this kicked off big time in, in Europe in particular and in Australia, had, a, had what I think was a very important meeting about the so-called silent pandemic. It's very uh, interesting how things have unfolded in the weeks following that, the silent pandemic of post-operative morbidity and mortality. Uh, we're putting that out after this podcast, Mike, that's going out on Sunday. We're recording this on Saturday afternoon. We're going to put out the interview that you and I had with Professor Guy Ludbrook from Adelaide. Do, do you think that's still, that, that story is still important at the moment or possibly even more important than when we recorded it a few weeks ago? I think, I think it's really important. Um, uh, much, you know, a lot of hospital activity uh, is, ca- we can't just turn off. So mm-hmm. most of, about 75% of the activity in our hospital is not elective. It's, it's urgent cancer care, it's hot cardiac patients, it's, it's uh, patients with pneumonia coming through the front door. Uh, and there will be a lot of surgery going on despite the COVID uh, pandemic. So I think the other pandemic will be in play at, at, at a time where there is a really sharp squeeze on the availability of what we consider to be an important resource post-operatively, which is, is some kind of augmented care, critical care environment. So, so I think it'd be very interesting how people... Uh, in this time where there's clearly a lot of uh, innovation taking yes. place, and we were, we're having to be very uh, quick thinking and broad minded about w- what constitutes critical care, where we can ventilate patients. And I think, I think we'll have to think similarly about how we uh, appropriately care for patients after surgery when the risk of complications is high, because most of the surgery that we're going to carry on doing is going to be the higher risk surgery. Now, some of the documents we've been involved in writing over the decades have repeatedly described you know, what we think is in the patient's best interest. And we've often failed in being allowed to follow through to deliver that because of the resource debates. And those are always there. But it does seem at the moment that in the relatively limited cohort of patients who need to go ahead and have their, the emergency surgery is going to happen anyway, the scheduled surgery is we, we should be able to look after those by deploying all of those things that we think could even further improve those outcomes. And if at the end of that, it hasn't really made a huge difference in the way that we think it could, then we could stop again. But it just strikes me as a great opportunity to go for it. I think it is, you know, you've got to, you've got to take opportunity out of these challenges. Uh, And I, and I think one of the reflections uh, well, there's a couple of things we may reflect on afterwards. One is perhaps wishing we had a few more critical care beds when we started, and that, mm. that's a drum that's been banged for a number of years, but I suspect we'll have considerably more resonance after mm. this is all blown over. And the second is understanding more about the notion of intermediate care, because we will be forced to work in environments that we didn't previously work in, and particularly for the post-op care, because the regular critical care facilities, I think, will are likely to be full, if not overwhelmed, by COVID patients and hopefully we will learn new ways of working that will be persistent long term. Yeah so in the podcast that follows this there's the three major components of it two of them are gone into in greater detail there's the evaluating risk beforehand and the prehabilitation story so there's absolutely no reason in the same way that Macmillan Trust is pushing up its efforts to help people at home prehabilitate with in relationship to their cancer treatments is all of those prehab things can be done it can be done in parks and gardens at home online and then intraoperatively enhanced recovery we keep talking about that you know full-on enhanced recovery and post-operatively there's this arc principle arcc that professor ludbrook goes into in detail at the end of it can you give us a thumbnail sketch of what you heard from that discussion it'll, it'll be in greater detail in the pod that follows so i think what what guy ludbrook is talking about it, it has been has been around for a while in different guises so that the overnight intensive care approach, uh, some of the, some surgical high dependencies attempt to do this, but it's, it's just keeping a really close eye in the immediate post-operative period on the, on the basic physiology and uh, av- avoiding the failure to rescue scenario. Uh, and certainly Guy's early experience uh, in Adelaide seems to have been really encouraging in terms of getting patients out of hospital quicker, using less critical care, and having less readmission. So it's a compelling story when you hear it. It is. I think this really is the avoiding critical care in particular, which is a surrogate for the patients have done really well. I mean, that was when we originally went to lobby for the critical care beds back with David Bennett. Gosh, it's 20 years ago now, I think we went to do it. You know, the elevator pitch at that time all related to the patients 
who were sent back to the floor who subsequently developed complications and were then admitted to critical care. Their consumption of critical care resources was disproportionately enormous compared to if we'd all been able to get them home safely first time round. Yeah, no, we're, we're having some really interesting and challenging discussions locally, and, and I mean challenging in a, in a constructive way. So, that, you know, surgeons, particularly the cancer surgeons, are really deeply concerned about their patients who may not get operated on and this may not survive because of that. And so we're exploring a lot of different options in terms of augmented ward-based care. But where to strike the balance, I think, is very difficult because, of course, it's tempting to change the standards because we're under pressure and maybe just rush those patients through and send them back to the wards. But everybody is concerned by the fact that actually we're doing pretty well at the moment with our current use of critical care and we risk suddenly overwhelming critical care not only with the covid but with a backlash if you like from the patients we send to the ward who just don't make it when they're there yeah you yeah, know we don't i absolutely don't think we should send patients back to the ward i think what we should do is turn all the ward space into high care environments for these patients so that, I mean, that, the, the, that's, that's been deployment. our conclusion yeah exactly that that well that was a conclusion 20 years ago 15 years ago 10 years ago five years ago and last week is if you have the right risk rating and triage systems and the right level of care for everybody wrap everyone in cotton wool you use less cotton wool because you get it right first time and you ultimately use far fewer critical care beds i think it's let's let's do it okay right now Uh, opportunity out of adversity (laughs) exactly exactly and because and we we might be the ones on the receiving end of it soon mate so it's i think it's really (laughs) really important So PPE, lots of debates about our personal protection. People have seen, if they're not in our world, people dressing up in even more gear than usual. As I say, it's familiar to us in critical care to to do this and do it at greater levels at time. But there's a debate about how much is available and and whether it is being appropriately used or sometimes abused. I don't mean willfully abused by by over-deploying it and therefore draining supplies. Where, Where do you stand on that? So we locally have been an, have been okay, um, as in we haven't we haven't run out in a way that would endanger any staff member. But but there are we we've, we've at times run short. Uh, now we are all reassured by NHS England that that the supply chains are working and everything's going to come free. But I think I think that that may be very close to the wire in some places, judging from what 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 you can currently see. Recognising social media is not perfect, but but what we can currently see on a professional social media uh, I think it's really difficult to know so it's straightforward if you're doing an aerosol generating procedure on a COVID positive or COVID uncertain patient then for, sh- for sure you want full PPE visor etc I think the challenging uh, thing is is what what to do is is how far to carry that hmm. G- given that any patient and any individual who walks through the hospital door is essentially becoming going to be COVID uncertain as the this virus spreads through the population mm. and, and, and all of us all of us and, and all of us and mm. certainly any sick person is mm. you know even more likely to be so uh, how, where do we where's the line where we graduate from nothing to mask apron gloves to m- more elaborate ppe and and, uh, and some of that so so it, some of that's bound to be related to resource mm. um it, equally uh the amount of time we spend donning and doffing, there, there, there's a reasonable case for if, if there's a, a parsimonious approach. So if, if it's reasonable to have a, a mask and an apron and gloves for just going to say hello to a patient taking a history, then we should be doing that because we want to protect the scarce resource of the PPE that we'll really need for the sick patients who need the aerosol generating procedures. I presume we're seeing now in, in situations where patients are being put together in rooms having a certain level of respiratory support and teams are going in and donning getting their kit on and then applying their principles with regards to still doing hand sanitization etc and certain levels of changing between patients but not up not all on all off for everything you do so our sense. approach whilst we have national guidelines there is inevitably some local interpretation around this our mm. approach for our covid uncertain areas has been to it or is now to fully don when you go in mm. and then treat the PPE that you don as your skin. Mm. So if you go and do any sort of contact procedure mm. or if you make contact, then you put on a new set of gloves mm. and, and you change those between each patient as you should 
Yes. N- normally, if, if you weren't wearing PPE. And wash, and you can wa- wash your your gloved hands as well. You can still you, treat you, your gloved you hands as hands. That's the important you bit can. of it. And, and you say separate gloves, separate apron between different patients. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure everyone's up to speed, but if you don't know how to really wash your hands properly, there's a great little video up on that's tweeted out today about using dye to get an impression as to it. It's... it's it's not what uh, you see some people doing on the television to uh, to demonstrate the fact that they have washed their hands in the past. I'm not saying it's just politicians, but those are the commonest available videos. Uh, Mike, the, the, the final thing is about the ongoing debate about non-invasive ventilation, continuous, continuous positive airway pressure, and OptiFlow techniques, all of which look as though they very much could keep a very large number of patients off the need for intubation and positive pressure ventilation. So for those who aren't completely familiar with this, that's the tube into the lungs and the, the, the bigger machine with the billows effectively pumping air in, compared to having very high flow oxygen with tight fitting masks or different devices of that type. Now, part of that debate is area, what we call aerosolization. In other words, the droplets spread when you've got a more open system. And part of that debate is, will the oxygen run out more quickly? Because the, the taps are on much faster, you know, big picture numbers you might have. 10 litres going into a ventilator machine, you might have 50 litres or 100 litres coming out of some of these high flow systems. Those two assets, aerosolization and, and the oxygen supply. So I'll get to the, uh, so there, are, there, there will be, and there are some guidelines on this, but, but as, a, as a personal view, um, we, we started with a, an assumption uh, that, that high flow was not smart because of the aerosolization and similarly for NIV and, and, and within pretty much seconds you realize that that's not sustainable mm. so so as a as an opener we have patients who are uh who come in from the community with copd who would not normally be for escalation to invasive COPD ventilation being, uh, bronch, with, with, bad with lungs, chronic lung chronic disease bad lungs yeah yeah so they come in with chronic lung disease they wouldn't normally expect to have mechanical ventilation because you wouldn't expect they'd be able to get off that 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 type of support but they would normally have a what we call non-invasive ventilation, so just a tight-fitting mask, and you, you can't suddenly stop providing that. So so immediately, we, you know, we continued to do that. Um, one of the characteristics, I, th- I think it's clear that uh, non-invasive ventilation may save you using an invasive ventilator, and if those are different pieces of kit, which they are in many hospitals, mm. and the invasive ventilator is a uh, you know is is in restricted supply, that may be an advantage. And and certainly our early experience is that the the weaning from mechanical ventilation, these patients seem very susceptible to hypoxic respiratory failure. So just simply struggling to keep the oxygen levels up. And there may be an important role for non-invasive ventilation there, again, to free up a ventilator for the next patient. Mm. It's invasive ventilation. It's going to be a, as with all things in medicine, I think it won't be a black and white answer. And we're going to have to carefully balance things. And, and particularly as the epidemic tips up, from a critical care perspective. I mean, right now there aren't oxygen limitation issues that will evolve over time. We're going to have to make a judgment as time goes by as to the number of patients we have on oxygen within the hospital. Do you have any sense of the supply limitations? I mean, I remember we in the past have visited some of the big oxygen suppliers. And one of the things I remember is how small the footprint was of the medical gas component of those providers compared to party balloons and industry, which is massive compared to the medical bit. I mean, the substrate is is readily available. You know, we're breathing it. At the so I think I think the challenge is not the absolute availability of oxygen. Hmm. There's a challenge of getting that oxygen from where it currently is to individual hospitals, and then there's a further challenge of how many patients you have on oxygen within a hospital and the capacity of the pipeline hmm. to sustain the flow. There's a limited flow is extraordinarily large but if we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of patients requiring oxygen we may simply not be able to generate the higher flows yes so focusing on technologies that will still work with lower flows of oxygen is going to be very important i think now they're all just for us to remind ourselves they're all in the museums because when i started in intensive care the rotameters were very primitive and they did the ball didn't go up very far some of the older practitioners listening will remember this very very well so we were able to deliver uh, many of the current techniques by using different valves, reservoirs, flow accelerators, etc. So it is possible with much lower levels of oxygen, but we might have to, as is happening at the moment, when people are trying to come up with innovative ideas, it's probably worth looking in the old books and the museum as well. 
I think you're absolutely right. And there's certainly, a, as everybody will know from the general media, there's certainly a lot of work going into identifying or increasing the capacity of ventilators. And there's considerable focus as part of that work on what the oxygen consumption of different devices would be. And it's a lot more appealing if a device uses less oxygen. Yeah. So lots of good news related to all of this. The NHS has, as always, stepped up uh, brilliantly to get all of this done and a broader community. And, and so with the NHS, there's a lot tweeted about doctors and nurses. It's everyone involved and everyone involved in supporting the NHS. It's the plumbers, the electricians, the people who are putting food on the shelves. Everyone involved is, is part of this whole endeavour. With regards to, I know we keep whining on about this, Mike, with regards to the food on the shelves, terrible stories we're hearing of colleagues getting off really long shifts who then just can't get food at all. What's it like in your neck of the woods? It's certainly noticeable. It's not, we don't feel at risk of starvation. No. I mean, we live out in the countryside, but yeah. it, it, even in Southampton, although the shelves are relatively bare, most people I think are behaving pretty well and got the hang of the fact that actually the food is not going to run out. Yeah, it's fine. There's only so much you can hoard and, and that side of things should all be fine and, and yeah. i think as with everything else in healthcare and otherwise we just got to be you know kind to each other look out for each other yeah uh, uh, over the, over what would i mean the, the wartime analogy is really interesting neither of us have ever lived through <laughs> through a war but we heard lots uh, of stories yeah. but it, i think it will i think a lot of what we will go through in the coming months will will feel a little bit like that the covid spirit so lots of friends coming up with ingenious ways we're hearing this from around the world of continuing to socialize while distancing so you know lots of methodologies being deployed where you can manage to sit around a fire pit and bring your own glass and your own bottle of whatever it is you choose to uh, to to drink to chat away and manage to not touch anything from you know the pavement to the fire pit apart from your glass and your bottle and chat away and keep your distance and then head home again it's uh, it's just you know loads of different examples of that sort of thing happening which is good but it's great. Yeah, no, we had we had dinner with a, another couple last night, and uh, no, nobody touched. <laughs> and it was all fine, and we're having we're having Skype dinner with Granny tonight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's that's getting quite popular. It's working really well, and there's a whole load of Zoom, uh, Zumba classes going on, etc. So, Mike, Mike Grocott, you got a busy day with the kids now. What's the? You got th- uh, three youngsters. That's kind of challenging. But I mean, I know you're outdoorsy people anyway, and you have got lots of that around you. Yeah, yeah. So they're outdoors. I've I've got a call about ventilator selection uh, coming up in about five minutes. So yes, I've got a busy day coming up, but hopefully we'll get outside this afternoon. Good luck. Well, thank you for your national work. Thank you for everything you're doing, the Royal College of Ethics and all the other bodies. And good luck with the ventilation ventilator selection. Can I have a purple one, please? The- <laughs> Absolutely. Any colour you want, as long as it's purple. <laughs> all right, everyone. Thanks a lot. Take care, Mike. Love the family. Thanks, Bye. Take care. Stay safe. Top bed talk. It's Desiree Chapel here. Just a quick reminder, subscribe to Top Med Talk. We're a daily source of news and conversation focused on perioperative care. We bring you all the latest talk from all the major conferences in the perioperative space. We can also be found on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and we now have a free mailing list with special offers and additional goodies for subscribers. Go check us out at topmedtalk.com. That's www.topmedtalk.com.